recording has been started. OK, <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, I guess, is there anything specific? That everybody is like, really concerned about or certain specific material that's really stressing them out? I think just making sure I have the wraparound concepts with glycolysis and Krebs cycle. OK, um, there will be a lot of questions about glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, so let's actually go ahead and start there just because I don't know exactly how much time I'm going to end up having with um, kind of the whim with my child whenever he decides to wake up is when I have to figure out what to do. Let's see. And this was my uh, issue with the last exam. It was, I know the concepts very well, but when it comes to the questions, it's a lot of material in the questions and like pulling out specific words or phrases that would help me answer the questions instead of getting freaked out a little bit by the way he words the questions. Yeah. Um, I think. So one thing if you guys that you can do to kind of help with that. Is. This really wasn't a thing when I started the program, but I've been using it more and more as a really good tool to help myself. Um, is. You can, I don't know if anybody's used chat GPT, but this is something that you can do if you're, a lot of these questions tend to be shorter, but this is kind of helpful for me where I'll go in and I'll literally type in, write me a multiple choice practice test about whatever. And you can do the same prompt over and over and over again, or just click regenerate. And it will start to give you practice questions that you can go through. Um, and if anything, Dr. Sarkar does have a habit of making really long questions that like, for example, like this part of the question, like which enzyme is responsible for the phosphorylation of glucose to glucose six phosphate and glycolysis. That will be. Within the question somewhere, but there's just going to be there might be a lot of extra fluff before and after it. So that's why it's like. Having to figure out what the question is asking, but if you do stuff like this and get do some of these practice questions, sometimes I found that it helps um, when I see the longer question kind of pick out what the important information is. Um, as well as if there's a really, really long question, you have a lot of words. One of the best things to do is literally skip to the end of the question. And see if the very end of the question is the, the last line will actually tell you what the question is asking before you spend all the time reading it. That was very helpful. Thank you. I didn't even First, think of using chat GPT for like prompt questions. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a uh, I used to write. Practice questions for. Um, basically for for tutoring and stuff, and I've completely stopped doing that because anytime I need anything, I just throw it in chat GPT and look over them and make sure that they're correct. So it's a lifesaver <laughs> and it's a really good, really, really good study tool. And you can do the same thing with anatomy. So you could literally say um, and you can be super specific with chat GT GPT and it's like I could write. Um, give me a multiple choice. Practice test. Covering the origin insertion innervation and action of the muscles of the arm and let's see what it comes up with bam and it gives you questions all about the actions 
uh, innervation, all that sort of stuff. So and then I recently purchased his book with the the questions at the end of each chapter. And um, it was recommended by another tutor saying that he does like to pull questions from that as well. Um, it, have you found that to be useful? Because like at the end of the TCA cycle, there's like 56 questions. <laughs> so like, I know he's not going to use 56 questions. So yeah, so I personally never use that. Everything that I've heard, though, um, has like people, everyone has said that it's been really helpful as long as you actually go like spend the time to go through them and understand what the question is asking. Okay. So, yeah. I will agree with that. I, um, he actually told me after my first test, he's like, get the new version of my book. And it breaks it down even more so than the one we have in gifts. So, Perfect. Thank right. you so much. See, I'm going to have to get, um, take pictures of some of those questions of somebody who has the new version of the book so I can go through it and figure out what's, um, what those look like. All right, <clears throat> let's jump into some material, though. Um, so talking about glycolysis, in, in all actuality, so glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, um, these are not going to go away at all. These will come up a lot in in different classes for different reasons. Um, so they're super, super important. Not necessarily to under, like to know, like have it memorized as much for like for this class. This class, you just need to have the whole process memorized. In future classes, a lot of kind of the base material from this is going to to come back over and over and over again. So we're talking about glycolysis. Um, it all comes talks about glucose, that the role of glucose metabolism. Um, sorry, give me one second. My baby just woke up. I'll be right. Let me, give me, give me one second. Let me just go get him settled. Also, while he's grabbing his little one, if anybody wants to get his book, it's on LinusLearning.net. Uh, you can get the hard copy or digital. Yeah, I just got the digital one, and the questions alone have been really helpful. I was thinking about creating a Quizlet from like key uh, questions so that people that didn't have the book could have at least access to some questions. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, next. Okay, so with glycolysis, the role of glucose metabolism, everything that we're going to talk about, we want to talk about glucose. Glucose is the giver of life in our body. <clears throat> um, know the vocab, so stuff like glucose versus glycogen, um, some of the terminology, glycolysis, um, gluconeogenesis, all of those sort of glucoglyco words. Um, you will have a handful of questions that are literally just like, which of the following represents this definition? And you just need to know the definition of those. You won't have a lot of the questions, but he usually throws in one or two just like that. And typically talking about um, like gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis or uh, glyco glycogenesis, which is the making of glycogen, which is the source from glucose gluconeogenesis, which is making glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, um, and glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glycogen. So words like that. He likes to kind of throw those in there. Um, not super important that most of your questions are going to really come from, from this chunk. The sequence of reactions in the in glycolysis of this whole part right here. And along with this understanding, knowing what the enzymes are, 
what goes to what. So like glucose goes to glucose six phosphate by hexokinase. Um, he loves questions about PFK, phosphofructokinase, and kind of this whole pathway. How glucose is outside of the cell, hexokinase phosphorylates it to create glucose six phosphate, and that requires an ATP, which is known as the first priming step. And then glucose six phosphate gets acted on by phosphohexo isom phosphohexose isomerase. And isomerase is just rearranging of the same material that's there. So it turns the glucose into fructose. And PFK uses another ATP to be to phosphorylate it into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then aldolase splits it up into two chunks. This is kind of our first step. This is our priming. It's what we call our priming phase, are these first um, four steps of glycolysis. Let me make sure. I think I should have it in here. Let me pull up the book. He always, 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 every, and this is a good lesson for the rest of biochemistry. Any time that he talks about the rate limiting steps or the rate limiting enzymes, I can guarantee you he will have a question on the rate limiting enzymes. Those are the ones he'll focus on. Those are the ones that he'll he'll ask you questions on. Let me pull up. Hey Drake, are your notes that you do for this available for us to look at afterwards? Uh, what do you mean? Like how you have the breakdown for the rate limiting? Do we have access to look at that without rewriting it all down again? Because I have a whole study guide filled out, but I'm like, how you wrote that down? I'm like, crap, I could use it. All like all of this. Yeah. These these are in the the notes bundles and stuff that I have. Um, I'll I'll share this one, this specific study guide with you guys. I think I have that one because I did buy biochem once. So yeah, if you, if you have the biochem, it, 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 it'll be in there. Okay. So I was just curious. Yeah, you're good. Um, so our rate limiting steps, specifically our hexokinase. We have our PFK, our phosphofructokinase 1. And then our pyruvate kinase, which is the next chunk. These are our rate limiting step enzymes. I promise you he will have at least one or two questions on each of these. Sometimes those questions are as simple as which of the following is the rate limiting enzyme. Sometimes it will give you. Sometimes it will give you a whole paragraph. Um, basically telling a story. And at some point in the chunk of it. It's like he'll have you have an exit, you have um, your glycolysis is being performed and you have a decreased amount of fructose one six bisphosphate, which of the following enzymes um, is going to be activated with. In that situation, and you have to know that fructose one six bisphosphate is created by phosphofructokinase from fructose six phosphate. And it will um, activate more when we have a low concentration of fructose one six bisphosphate or something like that. It's just a lot of wordage of it, and that's again why I recommend skip if there's a long paragraph, skip to the end of the paragraph, read what you're looking for, and then go back and read the whole question in order to get some idea of what you're actually supposed to be looking for in all of the word vomit. Um, there isn't a ton left here other than you just need to know the what goes to what, what the the reactant, what the turn, what product it turns into, what the enzyme is, 
and if anything is used or produced. So know between which steps ATP is produced between the glucose and glucose 6-phosphate. And then another ATP is used between fructose 6-phosphate and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And nothing is really produced in, uh, or nothing is, no extra things come out during the first half of glycolysis during the priming phase. Um, additionally, he might refer, I, I do recall, I don't know if he'll still ask these questions, but he used to ask questions that were literally like, in the eighth step of glycolysis, what is the enzyme used? So knowing, you have to know this well enough that you can write it out. And I would recommend that at the very, very beginning um, of the exam, if you can, if you have can find a way to kind of shorthand this, like G to G6, G6P to F6P to F16B to G3P, DP, along those lines, and even just um, the enzymes as well, HK, PI, PFK, um, A, in that way, as soon as the test starts, if you want to, or review, if you want to review this right before the test starts, and then as soon as it starts, literally write this down step by step. Um, so that way you have it right at the beginning. In order to fly through, in order to fly through the questions when they do come up. Same thing goes with Krebs cycle, um, being able to draw it out super quickly in the beginning to be able to answer questions quickly. Uh, any burning specific questions about the priming phase of glycolysis? I'll take that as a no. OK, um, <clears throat> some of the questions to think about is where is glycolysis occurring? The answer to that is in the cytosol of the cell. Um, where does the glucose come from? Glucose we're going to be getting from the blood sources, and it's going to be brought across the cell membrane and phosphorylated by hexokinase. I'm kind of giving a question and then answering the question right after. Um, okay. Uh, one more thing about the priming phase that's really important to understand is that from one glucose, uh, each glucose has six carbons. One glucose equals six carbons. And then we break them down, our glyceraldehyde three phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphates. We now have two three carbon um, molecules here. Very important to understand this in one more minute when we continue with this. Okay, so this is all the priming phase. Now we have the energy generating phase or the payoff phase. Um, <clears throat> we have our glyceraldehyde three phosphate and our dihydroxyacetone phosphate. This enzyme right here, this triose phosphate isomerase. Its job is to convert the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. It's going to rearrange it. It's going to isomerize it into another glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And this is super important because he can word questions this way from each glucose, <clears throat> how many glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate are produced? The answer is two. Or from each glucose at the end of the cycle, from one molecule of glucose, how many pyruvate do you get? Or later, he'll ask the question from each pyruvate, how many um, ATP gets generated in the Krebs cycle from one pyruvate? Or he'll take it. Well, eventually, when we get there, we'll answer all these questions. But from one glucose molecule, how much ATP is, how much net ATP is produced, or how many total ATP are produced? That sort of stuff. It's the way that he can word these questions will depend on like, if he uses. If he says glucose versus if he says pyruvate, if he says one glucose 
or like from one glycerol to hydrate phosphate, stuff like that. The way that he words it is understand where you are in the cycle to understand what numbers he's looking for. Okay, so going back, uh, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate gets converted to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. The glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, we're inserting um, inorganic phosphorus, NAD, NAD plus, and that comes out, we get our 2 NADH to convert to 1, 3 by phosphoglycerate. Um, super, super important to understand the NADH that we are producing during glycolysis. First of all, you do want to know the individual things, what's going in and what's coming out. They're kind of the overall formula. So, for example, the overall formula of glycolysis is glucose goes in and you get it's also glucose plus 2 ATP plus 2 NAD plus 2 there's Reduces. So this sort of equation, I remember him having a specific question about this equation. So you get 2 NADH, 4 ATP, and 2 pyruvate from this whole reaction. This equation, he has it in his book as well somewhere. He'll ask a question somewhere, something about something derived from this chemical equation of everything that you're putting in and everything that you're getting out. And okay. So we create glycerol three phosphate. We go to one three biphosphoglycerate, then to three phosphoglycerate. Good key to understand this. Anytime you have these numbers, that's telling you that you have things that are phosphorylated. The phosphorylation it tells you exactly what part is phosphorylated. And you know if it's going, how you have two numbers and then it goes to one number, you're most likely most likely going to be creating ATP. As well, anything that's a kinase. Kinase has to do with phosphorylation. Our kinases are responsible for creating ATP in this, in this situation. He'll ask, he could ask a question along that, like which of the following enzymes are responsible for ATP production? Um, and he could have phosphoglycerate kinase, enolase, and pyruvate kinase. Two of the above are correct, none of the above correct, something along those lines. So does he still do that? Did he do that for the first test where he had a handful of them, like two above are correct, none of them are correct, all are correct, anything like that? It's you would do that a lot with when I was in, in the class. I hated those questions. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the rest of this all is just pure raw straight memorization. You absolutely have to write this out, write it out between now and Monday, 10 times minimum. Okay. You have to know this like the back of your hand. Just know all of the different enzymes and everything. If you don't know the different enzymes um, from where they fit in, you're going to have a hard time with, with a good chunk of questions. Okay. And that's really just, it's just raw, pure raw memorization, which sucks, but it is what it is. And, um, so the whole process, know it, know it, know it, live it, love it. Um, here are our enzymes. This is kind of a, a guide if you want to fill this in from memory, you can. Um, but in reality, this isn't like super. Doing it this way, I found like written out isn't as helpful as writing it out like this and including all of the things like all of the ATP, the NADH is like, where everything goes in and, whatever, and everything that comes out and where it goes in and where it comes out. So whichever way is easier for you, um, do it that way. Whichever way you find that helps you remember them easier and better. 
personally, I find this is better. Any questions about glycolysis? Either as a whole or specifics? When it boils down to it, there's not a lot to it. It's just a lot of information and a little, little bit of info. It's, it's just pure raw memorization for a lot of glycolysis. Um, yeah, and just re reading the question carefully to know what it is that he's asking you for. But like I said, if you draw this out uh, enough times, as soon as you get to the test, sit down with your piece of scratch paper, write this out immediately, time yourself. Literally, with stuff like this, I would sit down and time myself. You should be able to write and draw this entire process in under 60 seconds. If you and in, including like the um, like everything that comes in and comes out and goes through. Um, if you can do that, literally sit down, get out your phone, put a timer on, set a timer for a minute, start and see how much you can get done and keep doing it and practicing it until you can do it in 60 seconds from memory. And like I said, abbreviate all of the different stuff um, and make like short, do it shorthand. But if you can do it in 60 seconds, you're golden. Same thing, Krebs cycle might take you a little bit more than 60 seconds, but same idea kind of applies. <clears throat> okay, so all of this, what is the purpose overall of glycolysis? So when we talk about glycolysis, we're really not in glycolysis for producing energy. We only get a net total of four of two ATP because we absorb, we use two ATP and we get out four. So at the end of the day, we're only getting two ATP, which is not nearly enough for us to actually power anything in our muscles. Additionally, all of glycolysis, he'll ask this question as well. Um, all of glycolysis is anaerobic, meaning that it does not require oxygen. There's no oxygen required to do glycolysis. The whole purpose of glycolysis is to give us pyruvate. Pyruvate is what we want um, in order to really produce energy. Um, we'll go to pyruvate when we get to the TCA, but I'm going to take a step real back real quick. Um, we get pyruvate. We get to the end and we get pyruvate. And then pyruvate has one of two choices. And it depends on the environment that it's in. If we have oxygen in our system, so meaning there is oxygen available in the muscle, the pyruvate is going to continue and go into the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. If there is not enough oxygen, pyruvate gets converted to lactic acid or to lactate. Okay. Um, so pyruvate gets reduced to lactic acid. And if as well, it, later on, if suddenly there is oxygen, lactic, lactic acid or lactate can then be reconverted back to pyruvate and be put back into the Krebs cycle or put into the Krebs cycle then. But yeah, um, lactate is the result of there not being enough oxygen in the area when we create pyruvate. Uh, there's something called lactoacidosis, which is just lactic acid builds up in the in the bloodstream. Um, it's produced in oxygen levels from the cell within the areas of the body where metabolism takes place. Uh, I think he had a question on this at one point, where during heavy exercise, lactate becomes the pure preferred fuel of the heart. Um, he has a pretty large bank of questions that he asks. So just over the past year that I've been tutoring biochem, I've had people tell me different things that he's asked. That, that's been on there, I think, once or twice. Um, these are those three steps that we talked about, the hexokinase, the phosphofructokinase, and the pyruvate kinase. These are our... Um, rate limiting and also are irreversible, highly exergonic. Remember, exergonic 
um, is also also known as exothermic, means that it releases a lot of heat. It's releasing a whole bunch of energy and thus making it irreversible because you'd have to put a ton of energy into it in order to reverse it. That's why it's hexokinase. If anybody remembers hexokinase, we also talk about glucokinase. Does anybody remember the difference between those two? Difference is is there glucokinase, hexokinase 4? So the difference is actually where they're located. So glucokinase you find in the liver, and the hexokinase is in the skeletal muscle. Just the location. They both do the exact same thing. They're essentially the exact same enzyme, just their location is different. The hexokinase is in the skeletal muscle, glucokinase is in the liver. <clears throat> Adam, uh, one. What was that? I was going to say I had a one on one yesterday with him, and he definitely emphasized the um, rate limiting enzymes. Yep, he always does. Like I said, you will get questions on these, I promise you. I think when I took the, I remember PFK on my. Our second exam, I think I had like six or seven questions just about phosphofructokinase. He loves phosphofructokinase. Yes, he uh, does. So understanding, so some of the terminology as well, this is kind of where you get into when the questions seem a little bit more difficult. A lot of it has to do with the terminology. Um, so like this part, when you're reading the question, knowing the words themselves helps a lot in speeding up the process. So we talk about inhibited allosterically by glucose 6-phosphate. Inhibited means that it stops. Allosterically means that it's binding to a site that's not the active site of the enzyme. Um, and it's inhibited by the glucose 6-phosphate. So that means when we have a whole bunch of glucose 6-phosphate available inside of the muscle or the liver already, we're not going to, our hexokinase gets inhibited, so we're not going to continuously bring glucose in. They'll probably ask a question something along those lines. Most most likely more with PFK. So with PFK, um, is going to be inhibited by ATP and citrate. We think ahead citrate in our citric acid cycle. Where is my pretty drawing? I don't see a pretty drawing of my citric acid cycle. Me. There we go. Citrate is our very first intermediate in the Krebs cycle. So if we have a bunch of citrate present, then we're not going to continue want to continue to produce additional. Um, we don't want to continue the process of continuing to pump it down because we already have a whole bunch of citrate being activated within the citric acid cycle. So we don't need to keep pumping out more. And also ATP, if we have enough ATP, you can you kind of look at this. If you have a lot of the downstream products, everything that's downstream, if you have a bunch of stuff downstream, you're not going to want to keep making more. If you have more of what's before it, so if you have a whole bunch of the fructose 2,6-biphosphate, if you have um, AMP or ADP, meaning that ATP has been used up and you don't have a ton of ATP available, that's going to drive the reaction forward. You just really need to look at, if you understand the whole process and you can write it out, you'll know if you have a bunch of the stuff that's beforehand, it's going to activate it. If you have a bunch of the stuff, a bunch of the products that are after it, it's going to pause it and, and pre prevent it. It's going to inhibit it. There's the word I'm trying to say. 
Um, again, again, proving great kinase. Same thing as the allosterically inhibited ATP, acetyl-CoA, long chain fatty acids. Mostly these two are the ones that we'll focus on um, when he'll ask his questions. And that's really all there is for glycolysis. Glycolysis is, you can pull a ton of questions out of here, but it's really a straightforward process. It's just, again, take the time to, to draw it out over and over and over again and memorize it. Finally, so after we get to the end of glycolysis and we have created pyruvate, remember that from each glucose molecule, from one glucose molecule, we create two pyruvate. Uh, the pyruvate gets converted to acetyl-CoA by this complex called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And big shocker, it gets decarboxylated, it gets dehydrogenized by this complex to get converted to, to be converted to acetyl-CoA. Um, in through here, he might have a question or two about pyruvate dehydrogenase, but typically he doesn't ask a ton from here. Most of what he'll focus on are like the coenzymes, like he'll ask about thiamine pyrophosphate. I remember he really, really liked. Um, this is that's just been in the past of what he's done. He he sometimes will have maybe maybe one, maybe two questions through all of. Uh, probably typically one, like one question through all of this. Um, still good to go through it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in it right now. Just because of the time crunch, but yeah, I'd recommend knowing knowing the co coenzymes, just kind of what the step does. And if you know that much, you should be fine with all of that. Yeah, here's our coenzymes. He loves to ask. He'll he'll probably ask the question, um, which of the following is not a coenzyme used by PDC? That way, and he'll give you four or five options, and one of these will not be there. Um, regulatory role of PDC in the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Same thing. It's inhibited by a bunch of the stuff that's downstream, or it's activated by some of the stuff that are that's upstream that we need to convert it to acetyl-CoA. Uh, again, I wish I could do more. Just if you under again, if you understand the step by step, what it looks like, and you understand the process through it, the inactivation activation questions should make a lot more sense. Our citric acid cycle. Let me move this picture into here. This is where a good chunk of your test is going to come from. And it's really kind of a lot of this kind of can kind of suck because um, there's just a lot of raw memorization here. I can give you a couple of, of helpful tips to remember this. So some of our mnemonics that we want to remember is this little chart right here. Couples cuddle insanely often after special sex for some marriage obligations. This one includes all, uh, it's a way to remember all of our substrates that are produced. So we want to know the order that all of the substrates are produced. When we get our um, high energy molecules, our NADH, our FADH2, and our GTP, the way to remember the NADH locations is I am the most important. So it's between our, it's after our isocitrate, our alpha ketoglutarate, and our malate that we get our NADHs. If you can remember these two things, 
this is huge. You're halfway there to knowing most of the citric acid cycle. Okay, really just this little chart. You know this, it's really, really helpful. The other part that you're going to want to know that's not included in that, unfortunately, are the enzymes. What's kind of nice is most of the enzymes are named after um, what they either the thing, the substrate before or the product after, like citrate synthase synthesizes citrate. Aconitase uh, is going to make aconitate. And then it, it and then it also takes you down to isocitrate. Then isocitrate dehydrogenase dehydrogenates isocitrate to give you alpha ketoglutarate. Alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex acts on alpha ketoglutarate. So the enzymes aren't as bad to memorize in this because typically they're going to be the named right before or then right after. I think actually in this case, all of them are before. Yeah, all of them have the name of beforehand. Aconitase, isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate, succinyl coa synthetase. Yeah, so it's not too bad. Um, the kicker is you also have to know what kind of reaction this is, whether it's a condensation, dehydration, decarboxylation. Um, if it has the word dehydrogenase in it, it's going to be a decarboxylation reaction. Yeah, you need to memorize those as well, knowing the order of what they are, what kind of reaction they are, because he'll throw a couple of questions in there as well. Like he, he could ask the question, in, typically in more words than this, but which of the following reactions um, is an example of oxidative decarboxylation? Or which of the following enzymes is responsible for oxidative decarboxylation. And he could throw in the isocitrate dehydrogenase, succinate dehydrogenase, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, and fumarase. Um, and from there, and, and then give you all of the above, two of the above, three of the above are correct, something like that, which is just super fun, but whatever. Again, not a lot I can do for you here other than this is just pure straight memorization. I've told you exactly what it is that you need to remember. And it's really just draw this out, draw it over and over and over and over and over again. Know what products are formed where um, and what the reactions are for each of these different enzymes and know the names of the enzymes. I, I wish there was more I could do for this, but that's really all there is. Um, let me put this in say again as well. Okay. Next part is now understanding the whole point of the citric acid cycle is actually to create our NADH and our FADH2. Our NADH and our FADH2 are really what hold the potential to produce a whole bunch of energy. And most important. <clears throat> and that's because it's from these reducing equivalencies high energy um, oxidizing agents um, that we get our ATP from later on. So we'll get 2.5 ATP per NADH and 1.5 per FADH2. He'll have you do a little bit of math where he'll like for each spin of the citric acid cycle, how many, how much ATP is produced. And so, you know, you produce three NADH, one FADH2, and you get one ATP or GTP out of it from the side as well. So that's one, two, three, three times 2.5 is our 7.5, 7.5 plus another 1.5, you get nine, 10. So each spin of the citric acid cycle, you get about 10 ATP 
or he can ask the question from one glucose, from one glucose that goes through and gives you one spin of the citric acid cycle, how much ATP is produced. And that's where you need to remember, this gets a little complicated, that from one glucose, right, you get two pyruvate. From two pyruvate, you create two acetyl-CoA. Two acetyl-CoA means that you get actually technically get two citric acid cycles that occur, which would give you double the amount of NADH, double FADH. This ATP is um, doubled as well. So you would get a net total two ATP from the from glycolysis, and you end up 10, another 20, 20 here. So give or take 22 from one glucose. I feel like that's not quite right. Here's my in the book he has. There's a hole. Um, it's also Saturday, so my my math brain might just be turned off today. After what chapter nine? After chapter ten. Here we go. Yeah, my math brain is just turned off. Uh, here we go. Yep, so you can see here, this little chart, we get a total from one glucose, you get a total of 30 to 32 ATP. I don't know why my role my brain is, is doing that. My brain is a little bit weird. Oh, because it didn't include the NADH from glycolysis, that's why. And this is why it's important to remember all of our different um, steps. So those two NADH, that's another five that gets included there. Okay, so around 30 to 32. Um, and he could give you some examples, just understanding and knowing that he's asked that question as well. Just a super simple, straightforward question of how much ATP do you get from each? Um, from each NADH or each FADH2. He's asked those questions as well. And just know it's 2.5 for NADH, 1.5 for FADH2. Uh, the dehydrogenase enzymes are responsible for that creation of those. Here are the three enzymes that regulate citric acid cycle. If we have, if we got asked a bunch of questions about glycolysis regulatory enzymes, we should also probably definitely know the regulatory enzymes of the citric acid cycle. These are the ones he's going to love to ask questions about. The ones that produce the reducing equivalents, that's the I am the most important, and then also the FADH, step six. where you get the phosphates produced, the GTP, the high energy phosphate, where it, what step you get produced the GTP. Again, all of this is this asking the same exact thing. And just if you can under, if you can draw this out over and over and over again and know what things you don't necessarily have, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't worry too much about water or necessarily the CO2, but the GTPs, um, where our NADH and NADH2 is come out of. No, no, all of those. And like I said, draw it 10 times between now and Monday. And if you do that, you'll be set for a lot of these questions. Uh, role and significance of gas cycle intermediates in metabolism. He will probably throw a couple of these questions at you as well. Um, this is this is a lot more. This is just setting you up, introducing you to this topic um, for later on. Really more for like biochem two, you get a lot deeper into all of this. But I can't remember which ones he he likes to ask about. 
the ones he might ask you about on this test would be like oxaloacetate with PEP carboxylase or PEP carboxykinase. Uh, he might ask about the malic enzyme. And he might ask about alpha ketoglutarate to glutamate. Kind of like the one offs straight from here. I don't want to tell you to not worry too much about this because it just depends on what he does. But I don't recall there being a ton from all of this. So spend more of your time on citric acid cycle and glycolysis than trying to memorize all of this as well. Um, this is the regulation. Again, activating versus inhibiting. If it gets activated by having the things before it that go into it. So citrate synthase is activated by CYPO-CoA or oxaloacetate because it's a cycle. Oxaloacetate comes before it. And then it gets inhibited by the stuff that comes after it. So if you know the cycle, you shouldn't have to write all of this out. It should be a little bit more straightforward. And that's all glycolysis to acid cycle. Any other questions? Any questions about those two? I, I hope I've, I've given you kind of like the main ideas and the big nuggets that you're going to be looking for, like what you need to really know. The rest of it is up to you guys. It's it's just going to be a time commitment from here until Monday. And the more you can do it, the more that you can do it and then sleep on it. So today and tomorrow and before Monday, the better off you're going to be. OK. <clears throat> um, a lot of that will be most of your exam. Uh, most of your exam is going to come from citric acid cycle and um, uh, and glycolysis. Um, <clears throat> okay. Jumping, going backwards into lecture six, the kind of the regulation of fuel metabolism. We have different hormone actions. We have two different receptors that we talk about. Your um, you guys had like a, a group exam kind of thing, correct? We did, but it wasn't really group. <laughs> um, was that did that focus on like on cell signaling only, or what was cell signaling? Was, okay, so these these changed. It used to be, it used to be we had a five question quiz that was like impossible to figure out. So. That was it. <laughs> oh, it was? Yeah. Okay. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um, Did you sit on it? <laughs> so talking about the, the two general mechanisms of hormone action, we have our membrane receptors and our nuclear receptors. Membrane receptors are stuff like our peptide and amine hormones, which then produce second messenger molecules. Where's the... The beautiful picture for this. The cascade kind of reaction. I guess it's actually way before this. <clears throat> okay, so we have membrane receptors, we have nuclear receptors. I think he has a whole like chart either. Oh, here it is. This guy, this chart. You'll get a handful of questions thrown at you from this chart as well. Just more raw memorization of the types of hormones. If you know the type of the hormone, you can know what kind of receptor it has. So like the peptide, the catecholamine, and the eicosanoid are going to be um, plasma membrane receptors. And our steroids, vitamin D, retinoid, and thyroid. He loves to talk about thyroid hormones. Loves, loves, loves thyroid hormones. 
are our nuclear receptors. And that means that the membrane receptors, the hormone is going to bind to a receptor on the outside membrane of the protein, which then causes typically phosphorylation of some other protein inside of the cell. And then that causes a cascade reaction all the way down um, to send out a signal. Nuclear receptors, these are typically small enough, are able to pass directly through the phospholipid bilayer through the membrane of the cell and then go into the nucleus and binds directly into stuff inside of the nucleus or onto the nucleus itself. Know that it, what types what types do that? So our steroid, thyroid, and vitamin D3 are nuclear receptors and our peptide and immune hormones are membrane receptors. Uh, main energy molecules, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. Understand they all get converted to acetyl-CoA just through different methods. Acetyl-CoA to go into the Krebs cycle is all um, is what's most important to give us energy to produce our wonderful ATP. Uh, insulin and glucagon. You'll have a, probably one or two questions thrown in there about that how insulin is decreases blood glucose and glucagon increases blood glucose so he'll give you some sort of scenario where it's like you're either in a fasting state or a well-fed state you, you just ate or something like that and say what is occurring to the levels of insulin or, gluc or glucagon or however he wants to word the question and just understand that the insulin gets released to decrease blood glucose and glucagon is released to increase blood glucose. Glucagon go, will go and act primarily on the liver because the liver is what really helps regulate our blood glucose. And the insulin will go over and all over and act on all of the different cells in order to cause glucose uptake. Uh, cortisol versus epinephrine. Epinephrine is also known as adrenaline. So if you know, if you've ever had an experience where you've had a rush, like an adrenaline rush, I said it's very, very quick acting and it's a big rush of glucose throughout the body. This is our sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight response. And then cortisol. Cortisol, this is what students high stress for long periods of time. This is actually what is to blame for why people tend to gain weight during high stress programs and stuff like this, because you get a constant um, release of cortisol and cortisol increases your overall blood glucose levels, which then causes increased insulin release. And so you don't have as much glucose stored in different places and it's getting stored as fat and a whole bunch of fun stuff with that. But you understand that epinephrine is very fast. Cortisol is the long-term adjustment for glucose levels. It takes a long time to go up and to go down. And also too much cortisol decreases immune function. This is why you get sick after finals. I don't know you guys, I get sick pretty much every single trimester for two or three days right after finals because Cortisol goes super high, you get really, really stressed, and it decreases your immune function. And as soon as it's over, your body relaxes, and then you get sick. If you didn't know that most people tend to get sick for a day or two after finals. So just be prepared for that. Little life, not that's not on the test, but that's life advice. <laughs> uh, insulin formation. Know these names: the free pro insulin the pro-insulin, and the and the active insulin. Um, just need to know the order that they're in and kind of what is happening. So free pro-insulin, uh, it gets the, sig the signal se sequence, will end up getting cut off to form pro-insulin. Pro-insulin, the C peptide is cleaved off to give us active insulin. You just need to know those three steps, what gets cleaved off, and then what does it become? What does it turn into? Here's all of our effects of insulin on blood glucose.
Um, and really, a lot of this should be think through the process kind of questions. So if we increase glucose uptake, what is that going to have occur? We increase glycogen synthesis. If we have more glucose available in the cells, we need to store it. So we're going to increase glycogen synthesis. We decrease glycogen breakdown because we're building up glycogen. We increase glycolysis and acetyl-CoA formation in the liver and the muscles. So we're going to increase our creation of ATP. If we have, it's like if you think if your blood sugar, that's why like after you eat candy, you get like the sugar high. When you eat a lot of sugar, it spikes your glucose. Your, your body starts immediately to create an, a, a more ATP, which makes you feel more energized. And then once it's out of your system, that's why you have to crash. Uh, increases fatty acid synthesis in the liver. Um, fatty acids are really just a whole bunch of hydrogen and carbon. So we take our glucose, if we have a large uptake of glucose, not all of it gets converted to glycogen. Some of it will kind of get broken down and reorganized into fatty acid chains to be stored as fat in the body. I mean, you get increased triglyceride synthesis in the adipocytes, which again, we have an excess of glucose, especially a large excess of glucose, it'll start to turn it to fat to store it. Um, mechanism of action of insulin via its membrane receptor. This will be the question that you'll get is that it has tyrosine kinase. That the receptor for insulin on the interior is tyrosine kinase. That's pretty much the only question I've seen him ask about this, or he'll ask the question, with which of the following hormones or whatever, do you have a tyrosine kinase receptor? And it's something to do with insulin. Uh, effects of glucagon on blood glucose. So what's cool is, if you understand one of these, if you know that insulin is glucose uptake and does all of this stuff, just flip the arrows. Whatever was increasing is now decreasing with glucagon because they do opposite things. The glucagon receptor is a G protein coupled receptor. Hopefully you remember what a G protein coupled receptor is. This, this will not go away. Like your very first exam in biochem two is a whole bunch of G protein coupled receptor stuff. Okay, so don't forget about G protein coupled receptors. Um, the insulin and the glucagon know that the insulin and the glucagon are both produced in the pancreas. Insulin by beta cells and glucagon by alpha cells in these specific clumps called isolates of Langerhans. Uh, he'll ask about, he'll, he'll more likely to ask about beta cells and alpha cells, like which of the following is created in alpha cells, which of the following is created in beta cells. Or you could ask the question, which of the following are produced by the isolates of Langerhans? And then it's both insulin and glucagon. And he'd probably have either an all of the above or two of the above kind of answer choice. The adrenal hormones that we talk about, the epinephrine, and we don't talk a lot, a lot about norepinephrine, but norepinephrine and epinephrine are very similar to each other. Um, they're produced in the adrenal hormones, which are on top of the kidneys. And we already talked kind of about what those do. Our negative feedback loops, again, what increases and decreases with insulin and glucose. A lot of kind of this study guide, like it's very, very repetitive of the way he has the study guide laid out. And you'll see it's like the same thing kind of over and over and over again with epinephrine and insulin and glucagon, just asking it in different ways. So you'll have a hint, good, good handful of questions uh, about insulin and glucagon and kind of how it interacts with the body. Um, with those questions, again, you might get like a long story. If you get a long story, skip to the end, read it, and see what it's asking. What else? See, even again, how much your insulin is formed, 
we already asked that question earlier. Um, the tyrosine kinase receptor, we already talked about that. The effects, the way he could also ask these questions in this way of talking, instead of asking increase or decrease of blood glucose, um, he can talk about low or high blood glucose, or he can give you a situation of you just ate a whole bunch of whatever food or you haven't eaten in so long, what's occurring in the body. And yeah, a lot of this is repetitive. This glucose and insulin, like uh, glucagon and insulin stuff, comes back a ton in phys two. So in, in your trimester three. So I would highly, highly recommend spend a little time for this exam, really breaking this, like understand this well. If you can understand this well now, kind of the process, what gets created, where, what effects does it have on the body? Why does it have those effects on the body, et cetera, et cetera? Your skill set yourself up really, really well for the future. Okay. Any questions about all of lecture six? Okie dokie. Moving on then. Bioenergetics. Um, you won't have a ton of questions on bioenergetics, um, but the ones that you will have, a lot of it has to do typically with our delta G values is what he'll give you. So, so bioenergetics is studying why certain reactions occur spontaneously versus not. So the law of bioenergetics is saying that it tells us when reactions are more favorable or when they're more likely to just sort of happen, where a lot of reactions, when we talk about enzymes, enzymes are used to reduce the activation energy. And certain reactions require a lot of activation energy or other reactions already naturally require very little activation energy. So we're going to look at kind of how to tell um, what how to tell which reactions require a lot of activation energy versus not the role of atp and other high energy molecules in energy production and utilization i'm just going to read through some of this so atp is going to allow the coupling or the pairing of the thermodynamically unfavorable reactions to favorable ones so you get coupling, so you get a reaction. Let's say there's a reaction that requires a whole bunch of energy to be produced. And there's another reaction that likes to break apart and release a whole bunch of energy. What they'll do is they'll pair those two things together so that they happen next to each other. So that way the energy released from one thing having their bonds broken is going to give that energy to something else that's trying to form something. So we have here the glucose plus a phosphate ion gives us the glucose 6-phosphate. Again, this is, happens thanks to our hexokinase. And then we have our ATP reaction. ATP gets hydrolyzed to form ADP and a free phosphorus. And that and our delta G value tells us whether the energy is being absorbed or being released. A negative delta G saying that it's giving off energy. If it's giving off energy, we say that that is exergonic or exothermic. Either way, you, however, however you want to say it. Dr. Sarkar typically says exergonic. If our delta G value is positive, that it's an endergonic or an endothermic reaction, meaning that it's taking energy from the environment and putting it in. This is typically what you see. Most exergonic reactions are going to have bonds breaking, and pretty much all um, endo endergonic reactions are going to have bonds forming. 
So for forming bonds, it requires energy to be taken in. If it's breaking bonds, it releases energy. So this first and second that I have here, this ATP getting broken down, getting hydrolyzed and releasing all of this energy will happen first. And then with this released energy, you have then the glucose um, binding to the phosphorus in order to give us the G6P. And you can look at the sum total here. In total, we have a negative 4.0 kilo kilocalories per mole still available. So this is what this is telling us is that overall um, we're, we're having extra energy be released um, into, the, or into the surrounding areas. And most energy within the body, the chemical energy that gets released, most of it gets given off as heat. And if we stop and we think about this, this makes sense. Because when our body starts to produce the most ATP is when we start using ATP, so when we're moving. So if we start working out and starting to exercise, glycolysis and the Krebs cycle are really going to kick up and kick off um, doing their thing. Which is why, one of the reasons why our bodies produce heat when we start doing those activities. Yes, like the movement and friction, all that sort of stuff as well, but it's because of these chemical reactions occurring and the glucose being brought into the cells and all of this happening that and the ATP being broken down is going to continuously give off um, extra energy, uh, which gives off heat, which heats up our body as a whole. I was just saying that other high energy molecules similar to ATP are used in the same way. Large molecules will be broken down and sort of release energy. This energy release will be used to create new bonds between other molecules or atoms. What you really want to understand here is understand that delta G, if delta G is positive, it's an endothermic reaction. If it's negative, it's an ex exergonic reaction. Endergonic, exergonic, and that's kind of, he'll ask the questions a lot in that way. Um, and he'll give you a delta G value, and that's really kind of how you can tell what's going on. Should be fairly straightforward if he gives you a delta G. The role of oxygen in energy production. So oxygen will be used in the electron transport chain. Um, we'll get to that really in the next exam, the electron transport chain. Transformation of energy within biomolecules. There should be here. The law, these two laws of thermodynamics. Um, he will most likely ask you a question. I think he asked the question, like, which of the following is the first law of thermodynamics? That's these are the three laws. Um, there is a third law, but we don't worry about that because that's a whole other thing. The first law of thermodynamics is energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. Like heat energy or electrical energy. Um, you have different types of energy. You can have heat energy, you can have kinetic or movement energy, or you can have chemical energy. So, and it's it's how it gets converted. So a lot of times in our bodies. When a bond breaks, when a bond is formed, within a bond, there's chemical energy. When that bond breaks, it's released as heat energy. That heat energy can then be taken and put back into another bond, which then is converting it back to uh, mechanical energy. Or in the case of AT with ATP, often when we move our muscles, it's trans uh, transferring the energy, releases the chemical bond. Um, it breaks the chemical bond in order to, I don't want to get too much into this because this will be physiology next try, but a little touch on it, where it'll um, bind to your myosin, and the myosin is what helps make the muscles move, so it's converting the chemical energy then into kinetic energy. So that's that's what it, we can talk about thermodynamics, kind of what that is. So he'll ask a question, literally one of the questions will be either what is the, which of the following is the first law of thermodynamics, or which of the following is the second law of thermodynamics, um, or he'll give you the law, like 
for a spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe increases. This is an example of what, and it's the second law of thermodynamics. That's how we'll ask that sort of question. I remember there being like one on that. Um, a lot of this is just definitions. Like Gibbs free energy, you need to know the definitions of stuff. So it's the energy that's available for doing work in a system. When we talk about a system, think of the 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 system is like a box where all of the energy and all the stuff is included in, and you can determine the size of that box. So if we're looking at a chemical reaction, we can look at put a little box around just the two things that are acting on each other, and that is considered our system. Or you can look at the body as a whole. The entire body itself is a system. Or like I'm here in my living room here and it's insulated. That's that's a system. Like if I turn on the heater in the system, as long as no energy can, if it's like fully insulated and no energy can escape, any energy, heat energy that I put into this room is going to stay in this room. That's what it's referring to when you talk about a system. Standard free energy change, that's our delta G. Um, and that's referring to the amount of energy released in the conversion of reactants or products. We look at the positive versus the negative delta G, which determines how much, um, whether the reaction is endergonic or exergonic. Uh, one thing to add to that, the more exergonic a reaction is, it's like the more negative the delta G the more likely that reaction is to occur spontaneously. Enthalpy, which is our delta H, is known as the heat content of the system. So delta H refers to heat. Entropy is chaos of the system, or it's the disorder or randomness. So while there is like a specific science to all of our bodies and kind of these different reactions. There's also an amount of just pure randomness that occurs. Where within each cell, a lot of the reactions that occur, like things are just kind of moving around. And these reactions occur when they bump into each other. So when when glucose happens to hit a receptor, like it happens to hit the receptor on the specific membrane, it then gets grabbed onto and then gets pulled and acted on by a hexokinase. So entropy is referring to basically the more amount, the more stuff that there is, the more likely a reaction is going to happen. And really, that's just a de more definition kind of stuff to understand about those. The equations, he'll probably ask you a question. I think he did for um, a previous class. Just like which of the following is the equation that relates um, delta, relates Gibbs energy to entropy or whatever. And so you just need to know what the equation looks like. Um, that delta G, we already talked about this. It re re releases or requires energy. Relationship of free energy to equilibrium constant. Uh, he might ask you what the equation is on here, but not much else. Our exergonic reactions have negative free energy. It's catabolism for the breakdown of molecules. And we already kind of talked about this. Endergonic are po is positive free energy, that positive delta G. Those will not occur spontaneously, and that is anabolism, a synthesis reaction. Or whatever. The significance of delta G values and its relationship with K E Q. This is just pure memorization. Um, 
if you have a positive delta G, KQ is less than one, and the reaction gets driven backwards. If it's negative, it's driven forwards. If delta G is negative, KQ is greater than one, and the reaction goes forward. And if it equals zero, solution is at equilibrium. So nothing is moving forwards or backwards. This is just straight memorization. Um, when he asks this question, he'll literally ask the KEQ is is four. What if hers? Or he'll ask you what is the value? What is the delta G value if the KEQ equals four? And you just have to know these three, like this little information for each of these. Um, the coupling of exergonic and endergonic reactions, we already talked about this, how they have them go together so that way they can both occur. And this just gives a couple of examples from his slides and stuff. And I'll include these and I'll send this out to you guys. So. Um, Hey, there's I leave little notes and stuff where like if something that I didn't know, I didn't understand, I'll throw it in there. And if I didn't put it on here, more than likely, if I didn't come back and add anything to it, more than likely it probably wasn't super important. So do with that what you will. Just read through this. I'll send this and read through this and and see if you have any questions about it. You can always message me if you have any specific questions. Hey, Drake, do you prefer yeah. to us to message you through GroupMe or through Teams? Either way, I get notifications for both. OK, I just sent you yeah. actually a new request for notes for DA and BCT anyway. <laughs> Sweet. I'll get those to you um, as soon as we're done here. OK, uh, introduction to carbohydrates. A lot of this is, again, just kind of like reading and definition type stuff, um, as well as naming. I'm trying to remember, a lot of this will be definitions, of what an aldose is versus a ketose. Um, and there should be a ch ch this right here. A lot of it is just going to be like naming, like he'll give you a chemical formula. And he's like highlighted the ones that are most common. That are like, these are the ones I want you to know the names of, and all of those are included in here. It's again, it's kind of sucks, but it's just kind of. Straight members, any of these that are like blocked. He wants you to know the name of. And it doesn't what won't make sense in this trimester why he wants you to know the names of these things but next trimester more so you'll understand why he wants you to have all of these memorized um don't spend too much time memorizing these names the ones that i would know like glyceraldehyde comes up ribose and xylose comes up you should hopefully already know glucose Like gl glucose, galactose, fructose are really common ones. Yeah. Bigger thing is knowing and understanding. Um, you should have gone over with you guys. Naming wise, the aldoses are going to end in os, where the uh, who was it? No, was it? It was um. The aldoses, like these three specifically, the aldoses versus the ketoses, the os versus the los. Shoot. For a little while since look at these. There's certain rules that applied for naming. In the book, I'm sure it mentions it somewhere, but this is just like the main ones to know which one is an aldose, which one is a ketose. Um, cause he'll, he'll give you like, 
um, there's a five carb, which of the following is the five is a five carbon ketose. And you need to know ribulose versus an aldose, which is a, a ribose. It's kind of this whole chunk is very, very stupid to me. Um, when I took this class, I would have heard there's not a ton of questions on these. And to be completely frank, like you can try and sit down and memorize all of these names or just try and recognize most of them, like which are three carbon, four carbon, five carbon, and just kind of take like the give yourself a 50 50 shot of of getting the right answer um because you have enough on your plate right now as it is of learning all the other stuff and knowing all the other stuff um a lot of this homopiled polysaccharides heteropolysaccharides glycogen starches these are all just definition like starches he'll ask the question which of the following is a starch you need to know amylose and amylopectin. Um, polysaccharides that are cellulose and chitin. They'll just ask about names of those. Same thing here. A lot of just definitions of like what these things are. So I would start with lecture nine, lecture 10. Make sure you have a really good solid footing on both of those. Um, and then check with, make sure you have a solid footing of lecture six, all through here, the glycogen, the glucagon, and the insulin type stuff. And then lecture seven, the bioenergetics and carbohydrates, put those kind of, I would say put those more towards the end of the setting, where if you miss some of that or don't get there, which for Monday, it's not the end of the world. OK. Any additional questions, concerns from you guys? I was just thinking on my conversation with him this past week. It's like, and just remember, guys, if you do horribly on one exam, it's not the end of the world. It's when you do horribly on two, you have to worry about it. I'm also going to say within this program, y'all, like a lot of people fail classes. It is not the end of the world at all. Like, um, does it suck to have to repeat a class? Absolutely. But I promise you, if there's it's not it's not going to be the end of the world at all. <laughs> like the, a lot, a lot of people repeat classes and it doesn't necessarily put them behind. Um, you just have to just just keep grind through it and keep going and keep going, learn the material the best that you can. Finding that out the hard way, but hey, that's what happens when you've been on a modified schedule because you're undergrad at the same time. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, this this program is a beast. Grad school is no joke. So give yourself the props that you have for being here. And also understand that while like you want to get through the program, Yes, you want to get through the program as quick as you can and not have to fall behind or anything. At the end of the day, do what's best for you. There's a lot of people that go on modified schedule or change things up. Um, and it's it doesn't make them any less um, or it doesn't make anybody better than somebody else or anything. Because it's it's a lot of work. <laughs> like this whole thing is a lot, a lot of work. And what's important is that you make it to the very end. That's the most important. I am sharing this study guide with you guys. All right, everybody. Like I said, if you have any other questions, 
feel free to shoot me a message and I will get back to you ASAP. Thank you again, Drake. Okay. Thank you guys for being here. I'm going to um, go ahead and stop the recording. I'm going to download us.